introduce yourself. This Saving the Republic is one broadcast at a time. The Clark Cast with Matt Clark. Matt Clark. Brace yourself. Uh, this is Rich Hoffman. I'm, I'm covering for Matt Clark while he's on a secret mission, which I'll give you an update on in just a moment. Uh, but first, I have a major announcement for Wham listeners. Uh, exclusively. This is the first outlet that you'll hear this. You haven't heard this anywhere in the country up to this point. And that news is I have decided that I'm going to run for president. Everybody else has decided they're going to run for president. I think there's more people who have cast their lot into the presidential race of 2016 than there are in the United States. So I might as well join the crowd and, uh, and jump into the debate. You've heard it here. Wham! First, I, Rich Hoffman, from OverMoyersWisdom.com, uh, am going to run for president. And I believe that this is another exclusive that you'll hear only here at Wham! And, and, and this hot off the wire. You might have heard that NASA wants to go to your, the, um, the moon, the largest moon, one of the largest moons of Jupiter, Europa. There might be possible life there. Well, some of that life is a little single-cell creature probably that exists in, in the uh, new found oceans that they believe reside there. And I believe that little single cell is going to also run for president here in the United States. And it probably has more intelligence than Hillary Clinton. So that's a lot of debate, and that should be an interesting 2016 run, and, and that would be a lot of fun. Now, and again, this is top secret stuff, but this is uh, for you know, Matt Clark's listeners. Promise to keep it to yourself. It's just between you and I right now. Matt's now a good week into his secret mission. Now, the cover story is that it's a honeymoon. But I can tell you that he's deep within the Pacific Rim at this very moment. Secret location, but he is, he is uncovering the, the, uh, the roots of a lot of the vast evil that we are experiencing in our news at the moment. And he will be with you to explain that in approximately a week. And he'll, he'll report his findings then. But I can't, I can't disclose his location because, well, that would jeopardize the mission. So we'll, we'll, we'll deal with that when he gets back. But uh, out of respect to his listeners, you, you need to know that he is out there, boots on the ground, covering on your behalf. All right. Now on to some uh, exciting things. There's some, again, a lot of interesting things to talk about uh, today. We have an, a very short hour together. Uh, so we'll start with, uh, you know, the shooting in South Carolina. It, it's wall-to-wall news. Uh, I was uh, at McDonald's last night watching the coverage on CNN, and it was very dramatic, and uh, they were really stoking the fires. And it's a tragedy. Don't get me wrong. It, it is definitely a tragedy. Uh, nine people, anytime nine people lose their lives, uh, especially in a church, it's very serious, very bad stuff. But then, of course, you know, the, the gun control cries came immediately out. Uh, which, you know, we spent all last week talking about gun rights on this show, and, and, and there's several outlets that continue to fight for the right to maintain the Second Amendment. But immediately the, the fight was to jump right into the, um, oh, you wouldn't believe it. Matt is calling at this very moment to uh, report on his secret mission. Are you there, Matt? Yeah, I'm here, Rich. How are you doing? How are you doing? I mean, you got bullets flying over your head? or What's going on? No, 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 no. The the actual uh, background noise that you hear right now is, and I kid you not, ocean surf. Now, it's not a vacation. You you were right to say it's a secret mission. And I'm actually on two secret missions right now, and I want to give full disclosure to one and give a hint to the other, because there is a sense of secrecy for the other one, and it's it's really top secret. So the, the first one, though, I'm actually, I found the ghost of Jimmy Hoffa. This is really important, and uh, he's running for president as well. Oh, so that is big news. So that's Jimmy three Hoffa. presidential yeah. runs that announced on this show within seven minutes. <laughs> so, there, yeah, three three new ones. You have the uh, the Jupiter alien, uh, life form, right. uh, Rich Hoffman, and you also have the ghost of Jimmy Hoffa, all running for president of the United States. Uh, no party affiliation for any of the above, I do believe. I, I, well, I, I think the Jupiter alien might be an independent. I could be wrong. I bet you Probably Hoffa was Democrat. a Democrat. Yeah, it's something like that. <laughs> now, the second mission, and I, I have to give hints, and you can't see me because this is radio. I'm winking right. right now. I'm doing air quotes with my fingers. 
So as I mentioned, there's surf in the background. You can you can hear it. Okay, you hear, hear the ocean. It's kind of like right. You I hear you're up to a shelf. This is the real thing. So imagine a tropical state. Okay, it's seven ten a.m. here. So that time zone should tell you exactly where I am. And I'm that's looking for a Matt. document. I, I know, I know. That's that's the only. That's well, you don't know where in that time zone. And I'm looking for a document that's over forty years old that gives legitimacy to somebody in government. I'm just going to leave it at that. That sounds like a vast conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's actually a big tourist attraction. <laughs> so it's actually a big money maker down here. I bet it is. Then you'll have to give a full report when you return because that sounds marvelous. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, the TSA has sunk to a new low. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you this much here. So uh, part of this is a secret <laughs> mission, the other part was a honeymoon. And right. uh, so it, it, for those that don't really understand where I am right now, the 7, 10 a.m. and the tropical state, it rhymes with Hawaii. I didn't tell where it was. It just rhymes with Hawaii. <laughs> and so I, I first took a, uh, a surprise trip to Vegas to surprise my wife here and beautifully set up. She had no idea we were stopping there, stayed at the Bellagio, very nice hotel, wanted to make sure it was a surprise all the way there, had some top-notch restaurants, some awesome shows lined up. And guess who gave it away, Rich? Guess who is the one entity that blurbed it out saying, oh, you're going to Las Vegas? I, I don't know. Who? 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 The TSA. The TSA. Are you serious? Well, that does yeah. it. Well, they, they can't seem to keep anything. They, they can't seem to do the jobs they're supposed to do, but they can sort of blow it for somebody who's trying to you know, spell out a surprise. Yeah, Exactly. Exactly. Completely Again, worthless. You spent all that time planning that nice, nice surprise, and then some slug boards it out. Exactly. No, I'm sorry anyway, you have I to deal with all those up. those elements, but uh, you know, I'm sure the I'm sure the waves make up for it a little bit. Well, that and a very strong mai tai. I mean, those. Uh, in fact, <laughs> I don't even know if I'm completely coherent right now. Uh, I've been drinking mai tais for the past six plus days, so. I, I could be speaking uh, Jupiter alien gibberish right now, but it wouldn't be any different than a Democrat candidate. So. That's exactly I, right. You could, you could you could pretty much just make too. armpit noises, and you'd be uh, more coherent. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is really more. weird. You, you were this is like a, a, a flip around on our normal gig. I, you know, I was thinking that I was going to call and saying, "Wait a minute, hold on, I'm the guest here. This this is very odd." The, the yeah, I'm sitting here looking it, at the, the the soft break, thinking, "Oh, we got to wrap this up in this you know about two minutes." You gotta wrap it up, man. I know. Well, it's, hey, it's your call. I, I'm just some schmuck calling into a weekend. No, radio, it's just it's just call. it's just an odd twist because I, you know, usually you know the caller bounces off the the cue of the host, and it's just a weird reversal because I spent so much time on that end. But you have the, all the, the the important parameters of your mission that you have to fulfill, and those are very serious things. And Wham is lucky to have boots on the ground like you. <laughs> Well, hey, the dedication that I have, again, it's not the Mai Tais, it's not the tropical climate, the palm trees, the, the sunbathing. No, no, no. It's, it's the dedication to this show, to this listening audience, to this radio station. To you, Rich, that's the yes. kind of effort that I bring forth. It's, it's exactly right. And his dedication, all those, all those little things are just the icing on the cake, but it's what's in the cake that matters. Exactly. Hey, uh, quick shout out to the last show that you did, the second call of defense. Excellent interview. And uh, I'm also a member of Second Call Defense. I've been a member with them for, ooh, a year plus, something now. But an uh, yeah. excellent offer they gave, and uh, feel free to give that another plug, another shout-out, because uh, Second Call Defense, you know, it's very interesting for those. And, and this is mind-boggling, but this is the kind of times that we live in today. If you, heaven forbid, have to pull the trigger in your own home to protect yourself, and this is the takeaway message, you are guilty until proven innocent. Normally, it should be you are innocent until proven guilty, but in that sort of scenario there, you are guilty until proven innocent. So it's really nice to know that if you have that, and it's an insurance policy, but it's also folks on the other end that understand where you are, where you're coming from, and they are you. They're of like mind. So it's comforting to know that in that shocking world that you, heaven forbid, you don't have to experience, there's some folks there that you can call instantly that will not only give you money up front for a lawyer or money up front to help you, but they will be there both literally physically be there or also on the phone with you. Police need to talk to you. Um, they have your back. So a uh, second call defense, awesome, awesome product that I believe in. Definitely yeah, that and, you know, it's like, like, for the offer from last week still stands. Anybody who goes to secondcalldefense.com and puts in the uh, redeem, redemption code Overman Warrior, he's going to give you a free, uh, free, 
first month, which is a great way to try it out and kind of kind of spin the wheels a little bit and, and find out what it can do for you. Because it's, you know, it's a very valuable service. And, and like you said, in the days that we live in now, you just don't want to get caught in uh, some sort of legal entanglement that's going to ruin your life. Yeah. You know, the one thing that he said last week, and this is so powerful, that if he had the right the right lawyers, or at least the right uh, first few steps after George Zimmerman shot Trayvon Martin, that it wouldn't have been a national story at all. Nobody would even know who those uh, those people were. So, you know, it's all about protecting yourself. It's all about making sure you take the right first few steps. Because yep. anything that you say could be used against you. So it's that's so exactly right. That's why you need a second call defense. So that's um, it's an offer that's made by the Clark cast because we had the last week's guest on, uh, the Overman Warrior Redemption code still stands, so use it and protect yourself uh, in these very trying times. You know, Matt, we need to get to a uh, we need to pay for your plane ticket with a couple commercials um, <laughs> and your return trip, so you're not stuck out there in, in Netherland. When we get back, I'm going to set up our, the next guest. You're going to want to hear him because uh, this is a guy I've known for a long time, and uh, he's you know, he and I had share in common a uh, love of bullwhips, and I'll explain that when we come back from a few minutes here. So stay with us and uh, turn up your radio and call a friend, and we'll be right back. Saving the Republic, one broadcast at a time. This is the Clark Cast with Matt Clark. Saving the Republic, one broadcast at a time. The Clark Cast with, with Matt Clark. All right. As I was saying before, Matt reported from a secret mission. Uh, I was at McDonald's watching the um, on the, the big screens they have in there, this uh, South Carolina shooting incident. And, you know, it was, it was the gun grabbers uh, were immediately trying to capitalize on it, which was sad. And every time something like this happens, you realize you have to really kind of dig in your boots if you're trying to protect the Second Amendment. And right about that time, I received a a very nice little email from uh, my buddy Roy Hill at Brownells, uh, who supplies gunsmithing equipment to gunsmiths all over the uh, United States, which keeps that the you know you keeps guns alive and and working. And Brownells just does a great job at all that stuff. And, and I just love those guys because if you've ever seen their big big catalog that they put out to their customers. It's just, it's a guy's dream. And, and it, every kind of tool you can possibly imagine is in there. And it's just wonderful. And it reminded me of the support that kind of goes on to keep that second amendment alive. And, um, it was, it was reassuring because, you know, you know, as soon as there's a tragedy, these progressive types are going to just jump all over it and, and do what they can to, to take guns away. And, uh, you know, one thing that, doesn't ever come out. You know, they talk about nine deaths uh, and, and how tragic that is, and it is. Uh, and immediately, the United Nations put out statistical analysis of uh, you know, that 80, there's 81,000 non fatal injuries a year as a result of guns and 31,672 deaths a year uh, that involve guns, 308 shootings every day, which, you know, really dramatizes and make it sound horrible. And, would scare everybody into just saying, hey, take my guns, make them illegal, and do all that kind of stuff. Um, but the context is always inconveniently left out. So if you know anything about, about <laughs> what's going on in the real world and how dangerous things really are, or, you know, how many people we're talking about in a statistical sampling, uh, just consider that there's about 32,000 deaths a year in the United States from just automobiles. And, and nobody goes out and screams, uh, let's make automobiles illegal. In fact, there are people ridiculing Elon Musk for trying to make a car that drives itself. So <laughs> it, you try to fix it, and, and nobody wants you to, And but yet it's convenient. Everybody wants their car, so no one you know, is trying to outlaw that, and there's more deaths a year in cars than there is guns. That conveniently gets left aside. And then worse than that, there's 44,000 people die every year from uh, some form of drug overdose. Uh, but yet you have the president declaring that we should decriminalize it and, you know, and, and, and states should legalize it. And you got all that, that progressive push. It makes no sense. But that's a very detailed topic. And I just wanted to kind of put it out there. If, you, if you're really confounded by the issue and you want to know what it's all about, I wrote an article that I put up last night over Warriors Wisdom called The Fan Flames of Racism, how uh, Barack Obama's role in the South Carolina shooting 
is at the heart of this matter. And you can see that by going to OvermanWarriors.com. It's the most recent article. You can Google Overman Warrior and uh, South Carolina shooting or just Barack Obama, and you'll see I have hundreds of articles written about all the various uh, things that he's committed that's kind of set the stage for a lot of this bad stuff. You know, you don't get to just fan the flames of hatred and then walk away and then get mad when something bad happens. Uh, you, 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 you're partially responsible if you're out there advocating hate, which he's done, and then wonder why there's not peace. So that's a whole different topic, though, and, and, and I'll offer that article as a solution. Uh, everybody's kind of probably, I'm sure anybody's, it's on the news everywhere, so it's hard to turn away from it. So I don't want to encumber you on this show with more of that. It's just sad. Say a prayer, and um, you know, anytime life is lost, it's bad. Uh, but as much as I support the Second Amendment, that's not what I'm typically known for. Um, what I'm most known for um, in just about every aspect of society, where it's, whether it's from business or entertainment or um, intellectual pursuits, is my use, my 30-year history with bullwhips. Um, when people say my name, they tend to, they tend to think of bullwhip, um, people, especially people who know me. And uh, there's a, quite a long history of that, um, and there's a reason. Uh, and the guest we're going to talk to in the next segment um, is a person that shares a lot of those same loves for me. And, and we're not talking about uh, bullwhips in the case of what you think, some kind of S&M chamber, anything like that. Uh, it's it's uh, how it, it pertains to Western arts and the preservation of our history as an American society. And uh, the bullwhip to me is is a uh, one of those cowboy arts that needs to be preserved, and and I believe very strongly in it. Same as with the Second Amendment, you have to understand who we are and where we came from. And over the years, I've used bullwhips to demonstrate uh, various management techniques because the bullwhip is a is a weapon of minimalist activity. You, you put forth a little bit of targeted effort. And uh, you get very, very explosive results. The crack that you hear at the end of a bullwhip is, is ba- actually the whip breaking the sound barrier. So it's, it's a very powerful weapon. And use it in, concentrated, um, in a concentrated fashion, you can really, uh, you can really get your point across. It makes a great melee weapon. It's, um, I use it for any, kind of, in any type of martial arts situation. It's, um, I think there's nothing that compares to it because of its flexibility. So I've used it for a long time, and um, again, 30-some years. And I've done a lot of examples, political examples, where I've kind of put myself out there and um, done videos to exhibit various complicated tax issues where I've cut cans in two or put out candles with a bullwhip to kind of explain why you need to, you know, management needs to have targeted, focused energy applied in a particular direction. The bullwhip is a great example of that, and I've used it explicitly over the, over a number of years to exhibit proper management techniques. And, and I know that sounds cruel and bad because the, the mythology is that, or I shouldn't say mythology, the uh, stigma it has is that it represents slavery and some some period in, in history where it's dark and you have a master over, a, over somebody who's oppressed. And the, you know, no one used whips like, like we use today in the Western arts preservation uh, to, you know, beat on people like that. And uh, so it, that's not what the use of the bullwhip as uh, my friend Jerry Deere and I advocate. And so when we come back from the uh, kind of a break at the bottom here, we do some news, we're going to talk about an annual event that I've been involved in, I think, I believe since its inception. It's over a decade. And I've known Jerry Deere for quite a number of years. Uh, basically, we met because he was doing this event uh, and it's a it's kind of a, a western arts throwback to what the kind of thing you'd see in the turn of the century with the um, buffalo bill show and um it, it's just a it's just a, a wonderful throwback we're a time where things were made a lot more sense so we're uh, we're gonna we're gonna get into that a little bit in a few minutes and we'll see you at the uh five five minutes after The 
Clark Cast with Matt Clark. This is the Clark Cast with, with Matt, Matt Clark. Clark. Call Matt now, 734 822 1600. All right, we're back. And uh, I have to say that all the topics we've been talking about, the guns, the Western arts, the, uh, the, the last couple shows from the last few weeks, uh, kind of center around a, a love of a, a movie that I grew up with. I loved it when I was a kid. It was uh, the movie, the Clint Eastwood movie, Bronco Billy. I always kind of thought it'd be fun to be Bronco Billy. Um, you know, just a, a Western arts performer that can't, couldn't rub two pennies together but uh, was living his life as authentically as possible and kind of keeping the American spirit alive with his, his acts as he travels across the country making little kids happy and sort of reminding everybody where they came from. And the closest person, even though there's more than two pennies to rub together, the closest person I've ever met uh, out of all the people I've ever known, I've known a lot of interesting people, uh, is my friend Jerry Deere. He's, um, he has a, a background as a, as a kind of a white-collar guy, He's a writer. He's a college graduate. He's a television producer, a computer technician. Um, he he fits well in every kind of professional setting that I've ever seen him in. But he's also been on America's Got Talent, uh, doing bullwhip tricks with his wife. Uh, he's also done films where he's provided uh, holsters, whip holsters for movies like The Rundown with The Rock. Uh, he also runs the only bullwhip uh, instruction studio in America. Uh, and he lives down the road from me. Uh, we're, you know, we're about an hour apart. And um, he's just one of those people that is extremely unique. And, and on top of all that, every about most every weekend, he um, his band, the Brothers and Company, perform a lot of throwback uh, compositions uh, that are just uh, magnificent. And uh, it, he his life is, is very interesting, and it, it really belongs on the movie screen instead of in real life. But, you know, when we we're getting ready to do this event, this Annie Oakley event that um, that he puts on every year, and it's in Greenville, Ohio, and he's on the phone with us right now to talk about it. Hey, Jerry, how's it going, hey, Rich? Hey, what's, how you doing? Uh, doing all right. Hey, you know, uh, after that, I don't know that I've got a whole lot more to say. You kind of built me up a little bit there. Wrap the show up and let's go. <laughs> <laughs> we're done. Thanks, folks. <laughs> Well, thanks now, for having me on. You have an interesting life, and you're, uh, that's, that's how I feel about you. Well, thanks. I appreciate it. You know, the Annie Oakley thing wouldn't really even be happening the way it is now, even without your help back in the day when we first started out. So I've got as much to owe you to that one as, uh, as I have anybody else early on. Yeah, and, you know, you started that. You did that whole event because um, you had uh, the, the, used to be a thing called the Western Arts Club that was an, it had Alex Green, who was a, a, a famous stuntman, did hundreds of films. You were personal friends with him. Right. Uh, they did this big thing out in Vegas every year where they tried to keep the Western arts alive, and um, it was fading because of the lack of interest, and some of those those older folks just sort of retired and drifted away, and uh, you kept it alive, and it's alive in its, in its current form any, anywhere in the world that I know of right here in, in well, it's in Ohio, Cincinnati, Ohio, and that's only a few, a few hours by car south of Ann Arbor where this is being broadcast from. That's right. And, you know, it's kind of interesting. I'm usually inundated by questions about the fact that we have such a high concentration of Western arts practitioners in this region between Dayton, Columbus, and Cincinnati. There seem to be just so many uh, that we have trick ropers and knife throwers, and they're not just, you know, amateur guys they're, or hobbyists. They're actually some of the best of the best. Right. So the fact that they're around here is kind of a kind of a testimony to how interesting this stuff is and why people keep it going. But that's why we keep the Annie Oakley Showcase going as well. Yeah, and a lot of people don't know that Annie Oakley was born here. I mean, you know, people forget that the Cincinnati area, the Dayton area, a lot of actors, whether it's from Tom Cruise, Clark Gable, Annie Oakley, they come out of this region because it's sort of the the backbone of the nation. Uh, you know, you have the you know the arts are definitely present in in the New York and uh, Las Vegas, Los Angeles areas. But what drives that art and what creates it from a from scratch usually comes from the Midwest, and then that's why your show I think is so special. It's it's different than anything you even get in Vegas because it doesn't even have all the fancy trinkets to it. It's 
it's the way the show has been done in Western preservation for over a century. And it's the closest thing anybody's going to see anywhere to anything like that. Well, I've done those, uh, you know, the big flashy Vegas style shows before. And the thing I, I, I like to connect with an audience. I'm sort of strange that way where a lot of performers, they want the edge of the stage to be their wall. And, if I'm not seeing what they're doing and, and understanding, you know, that I've made a connection with them, that they understand what we're doing and that we're not, we are performers, but we're highly skilled at what we do or we couldn't perform with it. And that's where you see kind of a definition between Western arts practitioners or even in any art fashion that they're exceptional at what they do. And then they go and become a performer from that and not try to do it the other way around. I've seen that sort of fail, but you know, you mentioned Annie Oakley being born in, in this region. Uh, she was born in uh, 1860 in Dark County. And the thing that was interesting about Annie is that she was not just a performer. In fact, she didn't start out that way at all. She learned to shoot to feed her family. And right. after that, someone saw her, and it kind of took off from there. But she was also a consummate businesswoman. She was one of the first people, uh, first women in the country that actually – set up her own business, and did all this great stuff. So there's a lot to be thankful for to Annie Oakley for the people that we have today who we consider entertainment stars have a lot to uh, to look back on Annie. And I kind of follow that as well. I try to bring the people that we have performing at the Annie Oakley Showcase during the festival are what I consider the best in their field. And we have, obviously, there's always somebody better than you are, uh, but I try to surround myself with the people that are better than me. So yeah, that I mean, way you, it, you it do, and there's, better you know, it's, audience it's, it's a it. weird collection of people that uh, you just, I, I've <laughs> never nice met those to types that. of people anyway. <laughs> but they're, they're great. I love them. I look forward to getting together every single year. Um, you know, we have contests and all that kind of stuff, and we always show up and compete against each other in the spirit of competition. But usually when it gets to the showcase that you guys put on, I enjoy sitting up in the stands with everybody else and watching the shows from all these guys that, that travel the, the the country doing this for a living, and, what's and interesting, uh, they, they could have chose to, to do a lot of things. And they, this. they actually live in their vans in a lot of cases, and a lot of this comes straight from their hearts. And they teach their kids the same the same practices, and and they do it for all the authentic reasons that you'd want them to. It's a it's a lot of fun. I mean, it's for for my end of it, it's a tremendous amount of work. But we've yeah. also scaled it down a little bit over the years to sort of not only go along with the economy as the the recession came in. We lost a lot of people participating because they simply couldn't travel to do it. None of us makes any money off of this thing. So it's it's not like we're being paid to do a show and I can, you know, give this whip guy, you know, five hundred dollars and that trick roper five hundred dollars and it doesn't work that way. So we're all there because we want to be. We're trying right. to keep it going and we nailed it down to one day this year, as we did last year in the new location at York Woods, which is just outside Greenville, about two miles. Um, and I think that's really where the the I guess the rubber meets the road, uh, you would say, because that's when you find out just how good these skilled performers are, because we don't have flashy sets, and we don't have neat stages and big lights and all that. We've got a patch of grass in front of our bus that becomes our backdrop, and that's what it is. And, you know, we always have the best audiences there. We always have, which I, yep. I always thought was a testimony to how the guys are doing. So, People yeah. love it, and they they come out. It's a it's it's one of the most inexpensive things you can see. It's one of, probably the cheapest Cheapest event that you'll see uh, that's equivalent to something you might get from Ringling Brothers. Well, it's, a, year, it's a really I, interesting I have to variety point out show. That this year, your, it is your, your cheapest event because it's free. Yeah, it's free. It's free. And, they change uh, you, you the, can, the uh, you can door go and get a lot out of it. Charge. They don't anymore, and now it's an absolutely free event. Everyone can come. Yeah, I forgot about that. That's right. Yeah, that's a big deal. <laughs> so that's even bigger. So if you're driving down from Ann Arbor and you want to go on a nice day trip where you're just a few hours south out of your way. Uh, you just just go to York Woods in Greenville, and you'll see something you've you you might have only seen a hundred years ago. Yeah, that's right. And I think probably what I think families enjoy the most about it is that this, at least our show, is entirely family friendly. We don't have blue humor. We don't have uh, you don't have to worry about the the foul mouth comedian and all that sort of stuff. We are a completely family friendly event. And, you know, it's it's interesting because we hear things. I was going to bring this up. We had uh, last year the Annie Oakley Festival Facebook page was shut down because someone complained to Facebook that the excuse they gave them was that we were promoting gun violence. And I thought that was an interesting 
problems surrounding this thing. They finally got it back up and, and managed to work it out. We just I think they ended up starting a new one. I'm not sure. But, you know, we hear things about the knife throwers and the, and, and the whips and all that stuff. Well, this is all dangerous. This is bad. We don't want to teach kids this. It's not like that at all. It, this is about competition. It's about sport. It's about accuracy and, and precision and marksmanship. Right. And it's intended to be fun. We don't promote any kind of violence with this at all. In fact, it's the very opposite of that. Right. It's just, it's just Western arts. It's, it's skills that were pertinent to the building of a nation. And it's something that uh, you know, I, I treasure immensely. It's, it's, it's unique, and, and I can't say enough about it. But, you know, you, you invented uh, here in, uh, in Ohio the only place it's done in the world, and that's the bullwhip fast draw, where it's similar <laughs> to the, what people think of with the pistol fast draw. You actually have a bullwhip fast draw that you invented, and it's, it's strictly an Ohio thing, and now everybody in the world watches it. Yeah, it's the, the fast draw is something we came up with. Uh, actually, we were at a reenactment event over in Eaton, Ohio, which is just west of Dayton. And Paul Nolan, who's one of our whipmakers and one of our practitioners, Chris Curtis and I, were kind of just goofing around. We had some time to kill, and this thing sort of came out of that. And when we applied that the following year to the Annie Oakley event, it became one of the most popular things we do because nobody does this. I mean, yeah. as far as I know, we're the only ones that do it. I saw somebody try to copy it a couple of years ago, and it came and went. And I think part of that is because it's hard. <laughs> how many times have you done it? You know how hard it is. Oh, I know how hard it is. It's, it's, <laughs> a, it's a lot of fun. It takes, ex, it takes extremely precise timing to do yeah, it. And it I have videos. If you go to Overman Warriors Wisdom, uh, type in Annie Oakley, you'll see videos from past events, and you can see the exact examples of what we're talking about here. Uh, but it's, it's definitely unique. You get, you get a whip out coiled uncoiled from a holster and then hitting a target against a competitor is difficult. And we're doing the uh, the Indiana Jones style fast draw again this year as well. Are you do that, again? Uh, that that one involves a little bit different because the ho- the whip is coiled up and holstered on your belt. Yeah. And you have to pull it loose, turn completely around, do a 360 or I'm sorry, a 180 go all the way around to the backside, pull the thing, draw and cut the target like you see in the opener of Raiders of the Lost Ark. The first time you see Harrison Ford draw his whip, we sort of recreate that whole thing to see if people can do it. But you still and have the eight foot it, whip it, limit it, on, don't you? Uh, sorry, what was that? You have the eight foot whip limit on it, don't you? Where yeah, the, you that's have the to minimum use a long size whip because he's bigger. using a ten foot in that shot. And right. you know, there's a lot about movie whip work that's nonsense. There's some of it that's real, but that one's just kind of a fun one to watch people do because it's really very <laughs> hard. You, I, I have a hard time doing it. I like to think I'm pretty good at this, but I have a really hard time doing it as well. So hopefully some folks will come in costume and do that, you know, Indiana Jones style that way. We'll see what happens this year. Great fan favorite. Hey, listen, we're going to take a soft break here and pay for some commercials. And when we get back, I want to talk more about your studio and uh, kind of let people know how they can get in touch with you. Because what you do is extremely unique. And if you're looking to put another skill under your belt, you need to call Jerry Deere. So let's go to a break and we're right back. This is the Clark Cast with Matt Clark. This is the Clark Cast with Matt Clark. All right. Oh, time sure flies. I can't believe we're already here again. There's just not enough time. I could probably talk for eight hours and it wouldn't be enough. But we're, um, we have Jerry Deere on the phone. And if you're curious about Jerry, just Google Jerry Deere, America's Got Talent. And you'll see Jerry and his lovely wife on that show putting out candles with a two-handed bullwhip routine and uh he's he's, it's it's quite extraordinary he's traveled all over the country done just about every kind of venue that you can do with bullwhips and uh he he actually teaches how to to work with bullwhips so if you have ever wanted to do something really unique uh he's the guy you want to call and he has the only studio in america uh in jamestown ohio that uh, offers that as a service, an indoor facility, and, and it's a really wonderful thing to have. So, Jerry, um, I, yeah, I've watched you do this stuff over the years and work with people, and you've you've taught people who really were not that coordinated and you know just wanted to do something <laughs> unique, and you've you've managed to to get it out of them, and, and it's pretty amazing stuff. 
Well, I think everybody has an aptitude for something, and, and the whip is a lot easier, at least for some people, than they might think to start out with. And it, it's funny, um, and if you want to know more about this, you know, check out our website, thewhipstudio.com, and you'll see videos and all that sort of stuff. But I've learned over the years that women are better at this than men are. And that's one thing that's always entertaining to folks. Uh, but we we try. We've been around, uh, I guess, close to 18 years now, 17 years for the studio itself. Yeah. And it's been a it's been a wild ride. We've managed to teach a lot of people. We have about 100 students a year, um, and it varies based on whatever's going on. The more movies come out with whips in them, the more busy we get. So it's kind of strange that way. No, we like that when they uh, when they do whip movies, but they just don't do enough of them to really keep everybody charged up. You know, people immediately think of Indiana Jones when they hear whips because that's the modern uh, interpretation of it. But a lot of people don't know that when uh, George Lucas wrote that character with a bullwhip, he was paying a tip of the hat to the, you know, old, the old Saturday morning serials like The Lone Ranger and Zorro's Fighting Legion and a book, I, or not a book, a, an old silent movie I know you like, uh, Don Q, Son of Zorro, where all the, the Douglas Fairbanks Jr. whip tricks were what, paved the way for a lot of our art form. That's exactly right. And you actually saw in Raiders of the Lost Ark, you actually saw some things. You mentioned Zorro's Fighting Legion. I think that's the one that has shot by shot some uh, throwback to the Zorro's Fighting Legion in Raiders of the Lost Ark. So what the we try to do is in the, uh, in the truck, studio, yeah. we teach people the difference between the movie magic and the reality of it. And that helps a little bit. And that's where your studio really thrives. You know, when you go into your, your place and you have all those plaques from all those Western performers and all the stuntmen that worked in the industry, because you back in the, you know, 30, 40 years ago, they, there was a lot of Westerns made and there was a lot of whip work. So people like Alex Green, who you were personal friends with, uh, had a lot of work. They stayed employed doing this stuff. And now it's pretty much a labor of love because entertainment really doesn't embrace that anymore. Uh, so you know, if you want to keep it alive, you have to do things like, what you do every day and, and watch it at places like the Annie Oakley Western Showcase that you put on. And that's the only source of it left. And, you know, things run in cycles. I'm sure those days that come back around, but you, you, to keep them, give them the opportunity to come back around, you have to keep them alive with an appreciation of what it, what's involved. And you can learn that at your school. You can, and it's really, you know, we, we provide a lot of other things besides whip work. We have trick ropers who can teach you that. We've got knife throwers. They're all certified, trained, whatever, um, to do this kind of stuff. And teaching is harder than doing. I, I actually like doing stage shows, but I like doing lessons almost as much because I love to see people, they get that first crack and they're just, their eyes light up and they go crazy and they realize, wow, that's really cool. What else can I do? And it's just something that, that's unique to them. They can take it out. It's something that's fun. It draws a little attention. And it's not the scary, mischievous, uh, mischievous weapon that everybody thinks it is. So you can do a lot of great stuff and learn some things. And I think you're right. I think we do have these sort of cycles about entertainment that maybe it'll come back. I don't know. I, I, they're talking about another Indiana Jones movie, but people were so disappointed with the last one that kind of you know, put water on that a little bit. But we'll see what happens. I think if they keep going, we'll end up with something. Yeah, I, I think, uh, and that's where you just have to chug along, and eventually the, the, the clock strikes noon or strikes 12 twice a day, and you just do your thing and let the, let the cycles run, and, and eventually it comes around to your number, and be, you got to be ready to perform. I think when you said something about uh, the difference between men and women with whips, you know, a lot, a lot of men, when they, when they work with whips for the first time, think that a lot of the sound comes from force, and, you know, it's a finesse thing, and you can't just go out there and throw this thing like you're, you're trying to throw a a ball through a wall. It takes finesse and precision, and that's why I've used it to help instruct management how to, to conduct more efficient ways of approaching a problem, because you have to figure out what your target is and know how to exactly aim at it. Well, if you can believe it, I actually, because the, you mentioned the other sides of my work as, as a writer, I have to think about what the audience is reading and what the, the sort of the progression of what you're writing about um, I do a weekly column called Deer and Headlines. It's an op-ed column. And one of the things I really have to struggle with is the sort of the format. And it's kind of strange you mention that because I use what I know from my shows and my trainings in my writing practice. I mean, it's kind of a strange right. thing to apply to that. But it really is. It's about learning the skill and putting that skill into practice and just getting good at it. And it's, it's not hard. People can learn it. And the more proficient you want to be, the more you've got to do it. It's like a musical instrument. Right. And, you know, once you get good, and I, I, it's, it, I've used my whip work in just about every part of my life, and it's made me better in, in every facet of it. I mean, it just helps you manage things. But once you learn a basic skill like that, 
it can it translates into every endeavor, and especially when it's something is that specialized. Well, anyway, we're you know believe it or not, we're out of time. We're up against the clock here. Um, if you want to know more about Jerry, he's got a wonderful, he's got a, a tremendous online presence. Just Google Jerry Deer. Uh, <laughs> you want to plug your website real quick? Uh, yeah, the whipstudio.com. You'll find information there about the Annie Oakley event as well as our training lessons, all that sort of stuff. And I think you're right. Just do a Google, and that's with a G. It's spelled G E R Y, deer like the animal. Go look at that. You'll find all the great stuff you need. Yeah, and I, and I have a um, just over in Warrior's Wisdom, Jerry Deer. You'll see tons of articles over the years that uh, when we report back from the uh, Annie Oakley events of years past, complete with video and sentiments and the kind of people that are that show up there world record holders all kinds of uh very unique people and um hey you, you come on down and join us it's the end of july and um you can't you can't have a better summer activity well anyway it's great uh, next week we'll have matt clark back and uh he'll tell us about a secret mission until then thanks for your time have a great day and stay safe For show highlights and more, visit www.clarkcast.com.